Oh, and we have a few more joining. Um, welcome to today's Mindset webinar on UX design. Uh, we've got Dan Flesher coming up in just a couple of minutes. Uh, a couple housekeeping notes. You probably have noticed that you're muted on entry. So if you have any questions during the course of today's presentation, please use the Q&A option in the navigation bar at the bottom of your screen. We also have chat functionality if you have uh, questions um, that you'd like to direct to me during the course of the session. Uh, Dan will be taking questions at the end. So uh, either you can send those through the Q&A or the chat box and um, yeah, we'll answer those at the tail end. We still just have a couple more minutes with people joining in. So, um, so just bear with us and we'll get started right at 11 o'clock. Great. Right. Um, yep. Uh, I think we are ready to get started. Just before we do, um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A um, box. Um, okay, so we're super excited to have you join us today for Mindset's webinar on UX design. Today's presenter is Mindset solution owner and UX design expert, Dan Fleischer. Dan is an expert SAP UX architect and design thinker. He began his SAP career as an ABAP developer and transitioned to focus on SAP UI5 and Gateway OData service development. In addition to his development background, Dan has a passion for digital transformation and design thinking, and for helping clients with their trickiest challenges. With a user-centered focus, Dan is involved in all stages of projects, uh, from design workshops to prototyping, and then through development and delivery. Dan's a frequent speaker at ASUG and SAP UX events and contributes blogs and development tips through SAP UX newsletter and the Mindset blog. Dan will be presenting at the upcoming uh, SAP Tech Ed event just next week. So if you have a chance to see him, please stop by and say hi. He's put together a really fantastic presentation to share with you today. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dan. Thank you, Amy. As Amy mentioned, today we're covering the topic of UX maturity, how you can identify with that within your organization, and some steps that you can take uh, to improve that UX maturity level. Some of the things we'll be talking about today uh, include what is UX maturity, so just getting started with kind of a baseline definition of what we mean when we say that we're going to talk about UX maturity. Then we're going to go into some of the different components that make up that maturity level. Those include UX learning paths, performing user research, prototyping, and running design workshops. And then we'll close out with some next steps on what you can do to take some of the things we've talked about today and implement that within your own organization. So as Amy mentioned, uh, I'm the manager of design solutions at Mindset. And one of the things that that really means is that um, in addition to my project work, uh, delivering and designing Fiori applications, I'm also responsible in, in some ways for Mindset's own UX maturity. So making sure that the services we provide clients meet the best UX practices and that it's something that we're always looking to improve upon and involve as new technologies, as new tools, as different things come out. So, you know, a little bit of lead in UX maturity isn't, you know, it's, it's something that we're also always evaluating here at Mindset. So as you move on, it's something that 
even really mature organizations can always look for new ways to improve, for better ways to engage clients, um, and all those different kind of things that we're going to kind of that we're going to talk about today. So like I said, first off, let's start with a baseline on what is UX maturity, um, and, and really what it is is how well does your organization follow general UX best practices? And this comes from a lot of different areas. Some of the sections we've talked about today, you know, how are, how are UX practitioners improving their skills within your organization? How well do you conduct user research for your projects? Uh, how often do you use prototyping and what types of tools do you use? So those are the kind of things that, that kind of make up an overall picture of what UX maturity looks like. And like I said, we have the ability to assess where we are at within our own teams and organizations and how we, how we run our projects. And there are ways to always make improvements. Like I said, even, even at Mindset where we've been doing user experience for a long time, it doesn't mean that there's not new things to learn. So even within our organization, uh, I'm always kind of examining where we're at and what we're doing and ways that we might be able to improve. So really across the spectrum, it, it's something that people working in user experience projects should be, should be kind of always evaluating and looking for ways to improve. So especially as SAP is kind of pretty early in its user experience game, people are just kind of really starting to pick up on Fiori as they trans, as they move to S4, as their employees kind of demand more mobile, more simple types of solutions. And as clients realize that this has a big opportunity to make changes uh, for their end users. So because it's so new in the SAP space, we oftentimes see a low maturity within organizations. And the things that we kind of notice or see as, as typical within those low maturity organizations are things like user experience makes our screens pretty. That's, that's how they see user experience. They you kind of check in with UX at the end. Uh, they slap a couple colors on the screens and, and ship it out the door, um, which as we'll talk about is far from the only thing uh, that the user experience team should be doing. Speaking of UX teams, a lot of times at places with low UX maturity, we see no dedicated team for UX. They don't have any designers. They don't have people trained in, in visual design or user research. And they're really just relying on, you know, maybe they've had a developer learn a prototyping tool and made them their UX uh, designer. And, and that's okay as long as that developer um, is skilling up in other areas of user experience, but it's important for organizations to, to treat that like a skill. Limited interaction with end users um, and only gathering requirements. We see these kind of things as people want to know what data elements on the screen what do you need to do to your job and then kind of walk out the door? Whereas, you know, when we get into the user research part of things today, we'll see that there's a lot more that we can be doing and limited prototyping. So people will often go ahead and create applications based on this list of requirements, not do any sort of prototyping, not validate this with their users. And as we've seen, that can cause a lot of headaches when we get to development. So these are some of the things that we see with low maturity organizations. Maybe you see some of these things with your clients or within your own teams. Um, the good news is even if your organization is at square one, there are steps that you can take to improve. And that's a lot of the things that we'll be going over today. Hopefully, you know, if nothing else, you can jot down one note from today, I'm gonna improve on this step. And that'll be your first step in making your organization better from a user experience standpoint. So if you're in a manager position, you know, you have the ability to really drive this within your teams, uh, get them skilled up in UX, encourage them to do learning, um, you know, maybe provide budget for some learning, um, and, and look at ways to implement some of these tools within your own projects and, and get the help of your teams for that. If you're more of an individual contributor, you can learn some of these new tools today, some of these learning opportunities and take advantage of some of those. You could create a proof of concept and then start working with prototyping tools and introduce your teams to the things that they might be able to create. So kind of no matter where you're at within your organization, you do have the ability to affect change. And it's not really important where you start. So even if you ticked off everything we saw on the low maturity slide, um, that's, you know, you, you can understand that now, you know where you're at. 
and we can take steps by you know, looking at the things we're going to talk about today and choose some things that you think you can do to improve a UX maturity within your organization. So one of the great ways to start, especially for places that don't have dedicated teams or especially for folks that aren't already trained in user experience is starting with some learning. And this little bit of background on me. So I did start with very pure ABOT development within SAP. As I saw tools like Fiori coming out, I got into the development side of that, first on the gateway side of things and then next on the UI5 front end of the applications. And that's when I kind of realized that what I was really passionate about was the user experience side of things and the ability that that has to understand the users, really dive in at what their challenges are and use that to create new and better experiences. So coming out of school, coming out of my, you know, into my first job, I was not someone that was trained formally in user experience. It's something that I picked up through reading a lot of articles, taking a lot of courses, um, networking with a lot of smart UX folks. Um, so definitely if you don't have any formal training, that's no problem. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can get there. One of the first and most accessible ways uh, are books. A little bit, a little bit old school, um, but definitely a lot of great content in there. Um, you can find probably a number of these at your local library. Um, and if not, I think, you know, pretty much all of these are under $20 or so on Amazon. So very accessible way to start your learning. And, you know, obviously there's way more than three books on, on user experience, but the first one we have is called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. Um, it's, it's been updated a little more recently, but it was one of the first books to really come out and talk about web and mobile design and making things simple and easy as kind of the name implies, Don't Make Me Think. And it's, like I said, it's been updated uh, recently, so you can get a copy of the updated version. And it's a really good start on the basics of user experience and understanding some of those principles on, you know, what makes a good experience and, and some of the pitfalls that you want to avoid. Sprint is a book that gives you a lot of good tools for running design workshops or design sprints. Uh, that's put together based on Google's design sprint methodology. So been used and, and developed within a highly successful uh, tech giant, well known for providing a quality user experience. And then it's been used at all sorts of other organizations around the world to deliver these types of UX workshops, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Another great book, Designing for Growth. Uh, this teaches design thinking with practical applications and inspiring stories. So I really love this book. It does a great job of walking through the stages of design thinking, a term you may be familiar with. Um, you know, you hear it at all the SAP conferences and, and different user experience forums. Um, but Designing for Growth does a great job of walking through those steps, giving you some tools to use in each scenario, so something that you can use to facilitate conversations within your organization, as well as giving just nice stories about how these have been applied and the results that they have. So it's, it's good to always hear practical use cases and understand how other people are using this to drive results. So like I said, books are a great starting point for UX learning. They're easy, accessible, possibly free if you can get them from a library or, or borrow them from me or a friend, um, but a really great way to start your UX learning. Another great option that's out there in the internet age, we have a lot of access to tons of great courseware. Uh, a lot of it is free. Some of it is uh, fairly inexpensive. And then on the other side of things, prices can go up a little bit, but a lot of times that comes with some extras. So Open SAP, if you're in the SAP space, um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with this, but OpenSAP.com, great site that has all sorts of courses. And maybe you took something a little bit more on the technical side around S4 migrations or building apps in the cloud or, or all sorts of different things. But they also have a lot of UX courses um, on sketching, visual thinking, user testing, Fiori 3.0 was the course they had recently. And while these are running, they're free to take. And if you follow along with the weekly assignments, you can get a certificate from those as well. Um, you can always take them self-paced. And if they've kind of closed, uh, you can restart them if you want the certificate, I think, for about $50. Coursera is another great option. So if you want to kind of move outside of the SAP space a little bit, 
and learn generally more what people are doing in the user experience space as a whole. Coursera has a lot of awesome courses and specialization, so a collections of courses that they offer. Most of them you can, you know, what I would call audit for free. You can access all the course material, um, view the lectures, anything like that. If you want a certificate out of that, if you want to be able to complete the homework assignments, get feedback on your work, um, and, and give feedback to other students as well, that does come typically with a, a fairly small fee. I think, again, about $50 per course, but don't quote me on that. Um, but Coursera is another great way, whether you're doing it for free or you're doing it for the certificates. They have a lot of great courses on user research from UC San Diego. Uh, interaction design, I think interaction design is from UC San Diego, user research from the University of Michigan. But there's a lot of great content from really well respected professors and universities. And again, can be very self paced, free to access, or a small fee if you want a certificate. General Assembly um, is an example of one, a little more expensive, but it is weekly content, lectures, downloadable exercises. And then it also has weekly one-on-ones with tutors, normally over Skype or Google Hangouts or something like that. But you do get more one-on-one -on -one kind of personalized help um, from a, an expert in UX design. If you do something like General Assembly, again, it's going to be more expensive than the other options, but it does give you a little bit more feedback, a little more access to experts. So again, with courses, this is something that is very accessible as long as you have an internet connection uh, and, a, and a device to access the internet you should be good to go. Um, and there's a lot of great ways to take free content on OpenSAP, Coursera, Udacity. There's a, there's a whole really gamut of options out there. Or if you're looking to get certificates or something like that, or you know, have someone provide tutoring, they have other options uh, for pay as well. So finally, the, the other option we really have for UX learning is attending conferences. So one that I attended that I really enjoyed um, was through the Nielsen Norman Group. Um, and they offer learning events, tend to be five to seven days long. You can attend whichever days you want. And each day is its own full day class and workshop on a topic. So it's a really great way to build out your UX toolkit, to learn from experts, to interact with other UX practitioners. And this is one that also offers a certificate if you take five courses and five exams. Uh, you become UX certified, and over time, if you take 15 courses and 15 exams and pass, uh, you get a UX mastery certificate. This is a lot of things um, that people that are kind of joining the industry will, will see them take this, or a lot of companies will sponsor uh, trips to these types of conferences, and they're a great way to uh, skill up in UX learning, to learn from experts, and, and to meet other UX practitioners. Google Sprint Conference. So as we talked about, Google has their design sprint methodology all laid out in that design sprint book. You can also access a lot of the materials and a lot of tools online if you just search Google design sprints, but they also hold a conference every year. So I'm in Denver, Colorado. It's right around the corner from me in Boulder at Google's Boulder campus. Um, it'll take place in October. I think at least for this year, registration is closed, um, but definitely something to look at down the line if you want to see how you can bring uh, the design sprint methodology into your organization and hear how others have been applying it within theirs. Last but not least, right around the corner, SAP's TechEd. So TechEd always has plenty of new information on the new tools. I'm sure we'll talk a lot about Fiori 3, other UX products that SAP has in their portfolio. Um, and you can kind of come here and learn the latest and greatest. Um, there'll be a lot of great presentations, customer stories, like Amy said, I'll be giving a few of them myself, so definitely come say hi, um, and, and we can chat more on, on this topic or kind of anything SAP, anything UX. Um, but TechEd is another great conference where, especially if you're in the SAP space, you can go and learn all the new tools, all of the new roadmaps, all of what's coming out, and interact with a lot of other SAP user-centric folks. The takeaways. So UX design is a skill that definitely needs building just like any other. So the same way that developers are constantly taking courses on the new development frameworks and the new tools that exist and everything SAP is bringing out, the same way functional people need to understand all the changes that come out with each release of S4 and all those types of configuration options, 
UX is a skill that, that also needs building, that needs constant learning. Um, you know, like I said, if Fiori 3 is coming around the corner, what does that mean for the applications we can deliver to our users? So it's something that takes a lot of practice and skill. So definitely, you know, if, if you're kind of on the lower end of that, or you're just getting started, you're like, hey, what's this UX thing? You know, like we said, we outlined a lot of good books and courses and conferences that can help uh, get your skills moving in the right direction. And I myself am still always looking for new new learning tools and new courses. So kind of a never stop learning type thing. Um, there are a lot of great ways to get started, many of them free or low cost. So if you have a public library nearby, if you have a connection to the internet um, and a laptop or an iPad or something, you can pretty much get started today. Um, in a way, you've already started by joining this webinar. Um, but there's also a lot of other great options we have out there on demand and ready for you to learn. So definitely one of the takeaways from today, I'd, I'd find one of those things that makes sense for you, check out the book, sign up for the course, um, and, and I, I don't think you'll regret that. So the next topic we want to go through is user research. So why perform user research? Um, and, I, and I think the answer is really in, in the name. So if we're going to be doing user experience projects, we need to understand what our user does. Um, we also need to understand how they feel about the tools they have today and what challenges they might have um, and, and ways that they would like to be operating that they're currently not able to, um, you know, because they're tied to SAP GUI, for example. So user research, you know, if we're, if we're going to provide a good user experience, we have to know who we're designing for. So this becomes a really key part in the process. Another great thing about user research is by engaging with our end users, letting them know that we're working on something, letting them know that we want to affect some change and make things better. It is for projects we often hear, especially big ones, we hear things about change management. So engaging our users early and often is a great way to start that change management process and kind of just roll it into your normal activities. So the users will be more aware of what's going on and they'll feel like they have a voice in the tools that we're creating. So that user research starts building that bridge really early on in the project. Understanding what's, what is and isn't working for our users will also make sure that we're not building the same tool in a new technology. So if you just take a list of requirements and kind of do a lift and shift from SAP GUI to Fiori, you know, there's a good chance that you're really not improving the, the user experience very much. It, it'll look a little newer, it'll look a little refreshed, maybe they can access it on mobile. But in terms of really understanding how users want their tools to behave, the things they really could use, you know, that could kick up their productivity, reduce the errors, make them happier, we have to understand them and what they're doing today and, and what they see as a better path to the future. So there are a lot of user research tools that exist out there. The first, and I'd say probably the easiest to do, are surveys. We can create these, you know, normally it doesn't take a whole lot of time. We just need to put some thought into what data we want to collect, you know, making sure that we use our time with the users wisely. No one wants a thousand question survey. Um, so making sure that we're asking the right questions to get the right information we need. But normally you can create these in something like Google Forms. Um, I think there's also a Microsoft Forms if you subscribe to Office 365. Um, there's also SurveyMonkey. So a lot of times these tools can be free or low cost or we already have access to them within our organization. And once we've created that survey, once we've maybe tested it with a couple people to make sure we, we're getting, you know, that we're, we're asking questions the right way, we can in theory send this out to as many users as we need to quickly and easily. So surveys are a great way of collecting a high volume of information without having to spend a ton of time on that user research. So once we send it out, hopefully we start getting responses back. And you know, it's pretty much as easy to send it to 10 people as it is to 100 people, it is to 1,000 people within your organization. So surveys, again, are a great way, tend to be low cost, lower, I don't say low effort, because they, they do require effort to create good surveys, but lower on the effort scale and certainly easy to send to collect a lot of information from a lot of users. The next research tool that we have available to us are user interviews. So interviews are a great way to have conversations with our users and to really get to know them, get to know what is and isn't working, 
let them tell stories about their experience. You know, what was a what was a challenging time for you uh, at work around this particular experience? Or, you know, what is your favorite thing about your day to day job? Or there's a lot of things that we can get in interviews that are hard to collect in surveys around really getting to the core of how people uh, feel about their work, feel about their tools, what they think could be new versions of them. So interviews are a great way to have that conversation and again, really to interact with folks and, and start that change management and, and to get them their voice involved in the next tools. The challenge with interviews compared to surveys is they tend to take more time to put together and they certainly take more time to conduct. So in the way that I can create a survey and send it to a thousand people, if I want to interview a thousand people, that's going to take a lot, a lot of time. So just want to be careful when we're doing interviews that we're not overburdening our users. Um, you know, that we're not taking too much of their time away and that we're not creating a research plan for ourselves that isn't going to work. So user, so interviews are a great way to augment maybe some of the results we got with our survey, but probably only something we'll be able to conduct with a handful of users, maybe five or 10 unless we have um, a huge research team. So interviews are definitely great to do, highly recommend them. Just be aware that they will take a little more time and effort to conduct, so you won't be able to reach um, you know, every single user. So make sure you kind of take a sampling, like I said, maybe five or 10 folks that you can interview and go from there. I'd say the next and kind of highest level of, of user research that, that we always try and perform um, that we see really design-centric companies recommending is to do user observations. So this is where we essentially uh, kind of job shadow people for a day to understand what's a day in their life like, what does their work environment look like, you know, what are they doing, what are the tools they interact with, what are the, who are the people they interact with, um, and really get a sense for what being in that position is like. And we've done that you know, plenty of back office functions in the finance department, in HR. Um, we've also gone out with sales reps, so travel to client sites and watch them interact with clients and see what information is most helpful. Um, we've been on manufacturing floors, we've been in mines, um, we've been all over the place um, conducting these observations, and they really give you the best glimpse at what the user actually is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So. Even in interviews, when you ask people what their process is, it's hard to remember all the steps. It's hard to remember all the tools. It's hard to remember the little cheat sheets and the workarounds that you've created. So end user observations do a great job of getting us all of that information um, in, a, in a great way that, that lets us learn directly from the users. We also have usability studies. So if we want to actually put a number on the user experience, we can use something like the system usability scale. It's a survey, but a kind of specialized one. 10 questions, we can send this out, and what we get back from it is a score on usability. So if we combine this with role and departments and organizations, we can understand where our biggest usability challenges are. We could also take the measuring points before, and let's say we then create a user experience project. You know, maybe six months, three months after go live, we conduct this study again and see if we've actually improved the usability and you know can kind of put metrics behind the projects that we're doing. So there's a lot of research tools that exist, ranging from fairly low effort on the survey side through definitely a little higher effort on the interviews and observation, but a lot of great ways to conduct this type of user research. Definitely, if, if you can't get to observations, try for interviews. Um, if you can't get interviews, make sure you're at least conducting a survey. So, you know, make sure there's some research tool in place that you can conduct uh, for any of your user experience projects. Just a quick couple tips on creating something like an interview script. So you wanna start out with an introduction that lets users know a little background information on the project, kind of why they're being interviewed or the goals for the session. This will help ground them in the work that you're doing. It will help kind of bring them on board almost as a project team member and kind of really set the stage for the interview. You can also collect some initial data points um, with some background questions. Just again, build that rapport, get them introduced to the project. This is where we might ask things like, how long have you been in your position? You know, how many sales orders do you create a day? Uh, on average, how many 
um, purchase orders do you have to approve um, and, and for what dollar amount, those kind of things where we can kind of get a level set across different people that we might be interviewing. So we can see if the person that's been here for six months has drastically different answers than the person that's been here for 10 years. Um, so some of these background questions help ground us in, you know, even across the different user groups, what kind of numbers, what kind of data are we seeing? Normally, three, four, maybe five background questions should be enough to, to kind of get the job done there. Then we want to move into our main questions. So 10 to 12 questions. And again, we're looking for people to describe their experiences. We want to hear stories. We want to hear what works and what didn't, what makes them happy, uh, what makes them sad with their tools. We want to get to the heart of how they think and feel about what they're doing today. And that'll give us a lot of great information on how we can make it better tomorrow. Here, we want to avoid leading questions. We want to avoid yes, no questions. So for getting people to tell stories and experiences, asking things that are yes, no, is not going to be super valuable use of either our time as researchers or their time as users. So again, we really want to focus on getting them to talk about their experiences with the products or the screens or the transactions or the tools that they're using today. Lastly, we want to conclude the interview by thanking them for their time and making sure that they covered everything they want to say. You know, you could use this as a last, you know, is there anything we didn't cover in the interview that you'd like to mention? You know, did you have any potential ideas for things you'd want to see in a new solution? And then again, just thank them for their time. Interview scripts are definitely important to create before going in. We want to be asking users the same questions so that our results are the same across different users. We don't want to just go in and kind of create a freewheeling conversation that can go all over the place. It'll, it'll be a little tough to get to all the data points we need without a script to help guide us. And again, it'll make sure we have consistency across our interviews. So before you conduct any interviews, definitely create this script, your introduction, a couple background questions, 10 to 12 main questions and a conclusion. And it's also another great idea to practice this with a colleague to make sure that it sounds right, that the words you're using are good, um, that you're not leading them to any sort of questions. So creating interview scripts will definitely help maximize the effectiveness of the interviews that you are able to conduct. A couple tips on observations. So interviews are a great way to scalable ways to collect information from end users. Observations are kind of like that next level tool in building empathy. It really gets us day to day, um, what is being in this role look like? What environment am I in? What tools do I need? That kind of thing. And again, this is something, you know, very design thinking focused companies like IDEO stress all the time about the importance of really getting to know your users. Um, even some more forward thinking CEOs and, and such, you know, said the importance even for them to actually get to know their customers on a personal level so that they understand how the business is serving them now and what they can do to improve upon that. So things that we typically look for during observations, so what type of environment is the user working in? Is it a back office, kind of typical cubicle function? Is it a manufacturing floor? Um, is it a mine deep underground with no connection and it's dark and it's dirty? Um, these are the kind of things we look for. You know, one, one manufacturing company we worked with more recently, environment's pretty dirty, environment's very loud, and a lot of users are wearing gloves. So if we're going to create applications that are working on a touch screen, we have to know that it'll either work through the gloves or that they may be able to take them off. Um, but these are the kind of things that we're looking for as we go around with end users to figure out what their, you know, what, what is their environment like and how might that affect the choices we make um, for devices or functionality or tools. So speaking of those things, what are they using today to complete their work? Um, if you're in SAP, it might be what transactions are they using? Are they using it on a laptop? Are they using it, you know, do they have any webbed in pro applications? What, what does their current tool set look like, both within SAP, also without? So are they using Excel sheets? Are they using Word documents, job aids, um, those types of things? Also, who does the user work with throughout the day? So do they have other groups that they're working with that, they have kind of consistent touch points with. What challenges do they have? So another big thing we want to collect through observations is the pain points. 
and also some of the highlights. So if there's things that seem to be going really well for them, if there's parts of their day they really enjoy or part of their work that they really love, this is a good time to note those things down so that we have uh, the improvements that we can make for the future. When we're kind of summarizing our, our user research, um, some of the tools that we have available to us are personas. So what we can use to create personas are some of the things we talked about capturing in our, in our interviews, our surveys, and our observations, including quotes, devices that they use, environmental factors, user goals, user pain points, any KPI information we collect. And all of this goes to you know, leading us into the next session we'll talk about in prototyping, but it's once we know that we want to create something better for these users, have we done enough to understand who they are and what they need? And personas are a great way to summarize that information, both for the design team as well as any external stakeholders or people that might be providing budget to the project. Another great tool to summarize user research are journey maps. So these chart the experience for a certain persona completing a particular task or step in a process. So as you kind of see here, we have the persona listed at the top. That would be Jumping Jamie. In the vertical sections, we have the different process steps. So define, compare, negotiate, select. And within each, a little bit of details on the actions that take place. And then along that curve, we kind of have their highlights and lowlights. So for this, we know that the negotiation process for Jamie is the hardest and probably has the most room for improvement which down there we can see that we've listed opportunities. So this is another great way to take those observations, take the user research, summarize it in a clear and concise way so that the design team has something to work off of moving forward. And again, we have something easily shareable uh, with our stakeholders. So user research leads us very well into prototyping. If you've done quality user research, if you understand them, <coughs> excuse me, if you've created a journey map and, and you know what pain points you're looking to solve for, you know, we want to kind of move into brainstorming the next solution and ultimately get to something like prototyping. Like I mentioned um, earlier, we, we can't just create things, you know, new screens and new experiences from a list of requirements. This would be similar to, you know, going to a builder and saying, I need a house with four bedrooms, I'll make it. Um, you know, there's a lot more than just a requirement, like the number of bedrooms that go into how a house is built and designed and ultimately the, the happiness that the people that move in uh, get from the way that it was completed. So the same way that we need very clear blueprints before we start building uh, houses, we need very clear prototypes before we wanna start actually building the screens. This allows us to test our designs with users early and often. And it's also a much cheaper way of refining our solution than doing it once there's code in place. So erasing a whiteboard and resketching, or even making changes in a high fidelity mockup tool, much simpler, much cheaper than if we've already done the development and moved it to test environment and all of a sudden the user say, you didn't get it right. Now any changes we make are gonna have significant revision time and significant expense. So prototyping allows us to avoid those types of headaches by making sure that everyone, including the end users, are clear on the solution we're going to create before we ever get into development. Again, like most sections we have in this presentation, there's a lot of different tools available to you for prototyping. Um, at least use one of them. So for example, easiest and most accessible would be a whiteboard or even pen and paper. Kind of like what you see on the right hand side in this image, we can create rough sketches of the screen that show overall layout, the different screens that comprise the application, some of the data elements that we might need on each screen, information we need to view, information we need to submit, all of those types of things. Even through pen and paper, we can start having that conversation. And if, if you've never done that type of exercise before, you'll really be surprised what starts coming out through this prototyping process. And you know, you'll think you have it right away and you'll sketch something and then users will say, oh no, wait, we, we forgot about this, you have to add this in here. So it definitely is a great tool to get people talking, um, to get people validating your solutions and to kind of drive forward on something that's gonna work for all parties. So if you're not doing any prototyping today, definitely start with some whiteboard sketches with some pen and paper, 
Um, and I think you'll be surprised at how far you can get, even with something uh, as low tech as that. The next kind of level for that would be wireframes. So wireframes are more like neater sketches. Um, they tend to be still black and white, kind of rough outlines, um, but we create them typically with a software program. I mean, even, even PowerPoint, or I've seen folks use Excel will work. Um, there's other tools that we'll talk about as well, but it's just another tool that you can use to start sketching the basic layout of the screen, start getting the data elements and the charts and the images or whatever you need kind of in place. Um, and a lot of these, especially if we're using like an online tool, created specifically for wireframing, we can actually add interactivity. So we can add hotspots. So when the user clicks on the next button or the submit button or the approve button, you know, we can navigate them to the next screen and show them how the application will, will actually work. High fidelity mockups are the next level. They pretty much let us create picture perfect versions of what we're going to build. This is where we're gonna layer in all of the styling, all of the colors, the fonts, um, the interaction patterns. So the developers can really take this as, as one of their tech specs in terms of what they will be creating on the interface and some of the ways that the interactions need to take place. This definitely requires a little bit more skill um, in terms of both understanding visual design as well as understanding whatever high fidelity prototyping tool you'll be using. But it's a really great way to make sure that everyone is centered on what will be built. And it's, it's probably the, the highest level you get to in terms of um, creating these prototypes, testing with users, um, and, and kind of agreeing upon all of that before development starts, and then and a really great handoff for the development team in terms of understanding what they're going to build. So in terms of wireframing tools, one of the most popular ones out there, relatively cheap, uh, is called Balsamic. Um, an output you can see on the right there of what you can make um, within Balsamic. Like I said, it's, it's, like a it's like a sketch, but a little bit fancier. Um, it's, it's not as rough and you can make clear straight lines and then put elements on the screen. And then again, this is something where if I wanna create one of these links and move to another screen or demonstrate buttons or something like that, I can also add some of that interactivity so that users can click around and actually know how the application is going to work. Again, this is great at validating requirements at making sure the users understand their tool, that it'll be easy to use, um, and, and that that change management process is something that kind of goes on throughout the life cycle of the design process. If you're looking to get more into high fidelity tools, what we use at MindSketch is what we use at Mindset is a program called Sketch. You can see a picture here. Um, you might be able to tell it it's a little bit more complicated than than what Balsamic might be. We have a ton of options. Um, around creating our screens and gradients and shapes and, and all sorts of things we can do within Sketch to make sure that we are creating exactly the output that we're looking for and that the entire team is centered on how that will work. Again, um, this is a tool that does require, you know, more knowledge of visual design, so that we're creating the right designs as well as experience with the tool. Envision is another one that we use. So we create the, the screens within the sketch tool. We bring them into Envision, and as this kind of layout is showing you, this little blue box becomes a hotspot, and we choose to navigate it to the next screen so that, again, users get a handle on how the interactions will actually take place. This is something that you know, we create a link. We can share it with clients. We can render it on mobile devices. Um, so that people get a really good sense of what their next tool will actually look like once it's developed. Another great thing about Envision and another high fidelity prototyping tools is the ability to collect direct user feedback. So once we do send this link out to uh, our users and our clients, they can make comments directly within there um, about functionality they need updated, um, labels they want changed, pretty much anything that lets us iterate on this design and get to a place where we're all centered and agreed on what's next. So Sketch and Envision are two great tools that they're not just used within Mindset. Um, SAP is building libraries for Sketch that have all the Fiori 3 elements. So it's a tool that SAP is investing in as well and that they their designers use within their app house. Um, by no means are these the only tools available for wireframing or high fidelity prototyping um, there's plenty from Adobe, 
Um, Axure is another tool that SAP's worked with in the past. They also have their build tool. Um, there's a lot of options out there for prototyping. Um, like I said, all I can say is we use Sketch and Envision industry standard very common, um, but it's not as important about the tool you specifically choose to use so much as that you are using some tool for prototyping because it's a very important step in the process. So lastly, the thing we want to talk about in terms of UX maturity is running design workshops. So again, mature design organizations are, are running workshops, are conducting user research, are making sure that their users have a seat at the table um, when they're creating solutions as well as their user experience team. So again, we don't want to think of the UX team as someone that after we create the solution, we send the screens to them to make pretty. Um, they're valuable team members that can really have you know, add value at every step of the process and can help facilitate some of these design workshops. So what we've seen is workshops can be anywhere from one to five days, depending on the scale of the challenge and the desired income outcomes. And that, that may not include all of our research. So, you know, we want to do some research first. We want to maybe do some observations, conduct some surveys and collect that information. And once we're at that point, that's when we have the ability to bring everyone to the table for a one to five day workshop, present that user research back, present our learnings, and really get to under creating the next solution. Core participants include, first and foremost, our end users. Again, they, they should have a seat at the table. Um, it really helps them to feel involved when they get to create their next level uh, tools. It's a great relationship builder between IT and the business side of things, so we definitely want to have our users involved. We want to have UX practitioners, so a UX designer that can help us create wireframes or high fidelity prototypes that understands, you know, core elements, uh, visual design, interaction design. If we're an SAP, so we understand the Fiori design guidelines. We also want to include people that have technical ability. So the developers, they're really great at helping us stay grounded in what may or may not be possible. It gives them the ability to jump in on researching some of the technical aspects. It also, again, we want to give people a seat at the table. So if they're going to be building this, it really helps them to connect to the end users and to, and to be you know, part of this process. And then process experts. So on the functional side, you know, who is our SD expert or who knows everything there is to know about HR and what the processes look like um, and how they might be able to help us design better versions of that, how they might go in to know what configuration options exist, all those different types of things. So typically what we see is 10 to 12 folks in these um, design workshops that helps us manage it in terms of, you know, having enough people to seat at the table without having so many that it, that it becomes very hard um, to center on a solution. So 10 to 12 folks, one to five days, um, proceeded with some background research and that will help us drive through our design workshops. One of the tools we have at our disposal that we can create beforehand with our stakeholders is what's called a design brief. Um, as you'll see here, it should be pretty easy to create. We kind of run through, um, you know, a project description. What's, what's the opportunity or the challenge that we're looking to affect change on? Um, what is within the scope of what we're trying to do? Um, and, and what's outside of it? What are we not touching? Maybe what other adjacent, what other efforts might be adjacent to this project? Any constraints we need to know about? So does it have to go live within the next two months or it's not an option? Um, do we only have $50,000 to spend on the solution versus, you know, $5 million? Um, you know, what, what constraints do we need to be aware of technically? You know, is there something that's out of bounds? Do we, we're not able you know, do we have to, is this going to be deployed on Android devices only? Um, those types of things help ground our design and understand what constraints we're working with. Target users, again, that user research question, who are we designing for and what do they want to see in their next solutions? Um, what are they having challenges with today? Exploration questions give us good opportunities for understanding what research we need to conduct. And then expected outcomes and success metrics really ground us in having a conversation on what do we want to get out of this project? Why are we doing it? And what, what are we looking to change? Are we looking to increase sales, increase productivity, reduce user errors? You know, what, what is it that we're really using as the measuring stick for the success of this project? You know, we can create this beforehand or as a very early 
stage in the design workshop process, but it's a really great tool to get everyone focused on the challenge ahead and, and what's kind of in bounds, what's a little bit out of bounds, um, and, and how are we going to measure our success. So Design Brief is a great, fairly easy to put together tool um, that you can use to, to get everyone on the same page. Typical agenda. So day one tends to be on focus on setting the scope, on defining success, on sharing what user research outcomes uh, we saw, either presenting personas or maybe creating them as a team. Um, same with journey maps. You know, wh what did we learn? How is this going to play out in terms of, you know, what we know about the scope and what we know about what we want to improve? And how does all this research help us get to um, that new solution? Day two, we want to turn all those insights we shared on day one. You know, we talked about the process, we talked about the challenges, we talked about what the users are having issues with and what they want to see in their new system. How do we turn that into the next tool? So here, you know, we might say that the journey maps highlight these key issues for us. Um, now we want to go ahead and brainstorm the features that will meet the end user needs. Sketch uh, the solutions as a team, so get out those pen and paper. Uh, head up to the whiteboard um, and really start sketching things out to understand, um, you know, what what that solution would start to look like. Start getting feedback on that early and work through a solution as a team. On day three, we can create those wireframes and those high fidelity mockups and really iterate and test and confirm kind of before we leave, is this going to be the tool that works? Do our end users feel excited about having that as their next tool? Um, and being able to use that to complete their work. Do we think it's going to line up with the success metrics that we defined on day one? And does it fit within the scope and any constraints that we might have set for ourselves as well? Is it going to be technically feasible? Is it going to be financially viable? So these are all the things we can work out on day three to make sure that we have the solution that we want. Output, so documented insights and outcomes, you might have personas, journey maps, sketches. We don't have to have all of them. So these are just kind of example um, documents that you can have coming out. We definitely want to have an interactive prototype. So we want to have a clear idea of what's going to be delivered. And then what we typically do is use that to create a user story backlog. So how do we move from this design? How do we move from this great new tool we created that's going to achieve our success metrics, that's going to make users super happy? And we, use, we create a user story backlog so that we can transition quickly from design to development and understand, um, you know, what, what's the highest priority features? How do we start to build that out? And again, collect feedback as we go. So in terms of the next steps, kind of threw a lot of information out there today. Um, well, there's still plenty more that we could go through. Um, but really what you want to take away from today is try and identify where your organization is from a UX maturity standpoint. Um, are you doing prototyping today? Are you running design workshops? Are you creating some of these things like personas or journey maps? Are you facilitating UX learning within your organization? So kind of see what you're doing, um, what you're not doing, and that'll give you a great idea on figuring out which of the activities that we talked about that you can do to get the needle moving on UX maturity. So if you're not facilitating any learning within your organization, um, maybe go pick one of the free courses from OpenSAP or Coursera, um, and maybe even invite some of your colleagues to take it with you, create a little study group, um, you know, something you can use to maximize your time and effort and get other people on board. Um, maybe you are doing whiteboard sketches, but you haven't really looked into a wireframing tool. Um, so maybe taking a look at Balsamic or other options um, would be a good way that you could kind of get your organization scaling up on that UX maturity. Other things to remember, so it's a marathon, not a sprint. Like I said, even, even at Mindset, even with a lot of UX experts, um, we're still always looking for ways that we can do better, um, ways that we can improve and, and kind of what's coming next, what are the next level of best practices. So, you know, you don't have to do, start doing all of these things tomorrow, um, but it would help if you start with something. Um, so kind of on that last bullet point, start today or tomorrow at the latest, you know, we, we pitched a lot of good ways here to get started, whether it's integrating new tools in your design workshops or something as simple um, 
as checking a book out of the library or, or buying it on Amazon. There's plenty of things that you can do today. Um, and, and really, like I said, it's, it's just important that you get started now and that you kind of help your organization build out that UX maturity and that, that you can be that change agent, uh, whether you're a manager or an individual contributor or, you know, on the board of directors, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can start bringing these activities in. So start with something simple, start with something you think you could implement um, and go with that. Um, with that being said, um, we can move to our Q&A um, portion of the event. Do we have any questions, Amy? Um, oh, sorry about that. I was just muted. Thank you, Dan. That was a great presentation. It just took me a minute to, to get unmuted. We do have a couple of questions. Um, sure. First question for you is, if there is no UX team at my organization, what can I do? Great question. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, one of the best ways that you could get started, um, if there is no dedicated user experience team, is maybe to start on the learning side of what we kind of talked about today. Um, like I said, I, I didn't start necessarily my career as a UX practitioner. Um, and, and I kind of started to go through all of that by taking these courses, by reading these books, by attending these conferences. Um, so there's a lot of things that you could do on the learning side of things to start skilling yourself up as a UX practitioner and being that kind of go-to resource for your organization. The other thing that might be worth checking in on is some organizations that we work with, you know, we're typically on the enterprise application side of things, but if they have a customer focused side of their business, um, there's typically people, you know, on the digital side, consumer facing, um, they create their apps and their website and all of that. So you might not have a UX team for SAP, but you might have a UX team for, you know, apps that your customers access. So there might be other ways to learn even within your own organization and kind of get them involved and help them uh, have them help you create that UX practice uh, within the enterprise space. Great. Um, the second question, how can I show the value of user experience so that my organization invests in it? Yeah. So you know, we, we tend to talk about user experience as an investment, kind of not an expenditure. So things like the design brief, as we're doing projects, help us ask the questions that create a return um, on investment. So we can ask, you know, questions around what's our success metric? Are we looking to take a 10 minute process and move it to a five minute process? Are we taking, you know, a hundred errors daily by users down to 10 daily errors by users. Are we able to reduce training efforts, you know, from a week down to a day? Any of those things would create a return on investment so that the applications, you know, it's not just a spend to create this new product. It's actually something that we'll be able to see savings from. Uh, more generally, if you just kind of Google UX ROI, you'll see, a lot of case studies that exist out there, a lot of white papers and research has been conducted on generally what the benefits of user experience are and how they are bringing a lot of businesses value. So there's a lot of resources either, you know, setting up our own projects to understand what returns might exist on our investment, as well as kind of more general research out there on what benefits UX brings to organizations. Great. Um, last question for you. What was the first thing you did when you decided you wanted to get involved in user experience? Yeah, so I think, like, like I kind of mentioned with that first question, but the, the first thing I did was 
find opportunities to to learn. Um, included, like I said, courses on Open SAP, and included books, included getting some funding uh, to go to conferences, to really just start to give myself a baseline understanding of what user experience is. Um, I think from there, you know, if, again, if you're that UX team of one, if you're that one person looking to affect change within your organization, you know, take your learnings, and if, you know, maybe you're the only one taking this course, put together a summary presentation deck, have a lunch and learn session, introduce people to what, you know, what it is that you're learning and why you think that that's really important for the team to understand. Um, you know, you could also use that to have a conversation with your manager around, you know, people do a lot of performance plans, you know, set goals for their year. You know, use that time to take what you've learned and set a plan for implementing that uh, within your team or, you know, within your organization. So definitely start with some materials to start that UX learning journey. Um, and then try and find other like-minded professionals at your organization or, you know, network at TechEd and, and start to share that. And I think that'll kind of create a little bit of a snowball effect in terms of getting other people to see the value um, and getting them to invest in user experience. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined us. Our time is just about up today. If you find you have any more questions or are interested um, in receiving today's recording, please let us know. Also, if you're interested in scheduling some time to talk with Dan about the mindset design thinking process or anything that was covered in today's presentation, please uh, reach out to us via the, the uh, email addresses that are in the chat box or in um, through the mindset website. Thanks again. Yep, uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn as well. Pretty responsive and, and we share a lot of great mindset content. Um, should be easy to find, Dan Flesher. Um, so definitely thank you everyone for attending. Um, and if, like Amy said, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and if you're attending Tech Ed next week, um, I'll be there as well. A couple other great mindset colleagues, so don't hesitate to stop and say hi. Thank you, everybody.